when I walk around in the downtown historic district where I live, I'm obsessed with taking pictures of old houses, and I'm constantly uploading them to my Instagram account. I feel like a historic district like we have here is an outdoor museum of Victorian architectural styles. I use the pictures that I take when I do lectures about architecture, where I show pictures of old houses, and I talk about what distinguishes a certain architectural style, what are the characteristics of that style. I start by explaining that the three predominant styles here in our neighborhood are Italianate houses, French Second Empire style houses, and Queen Anne houses. And they're not the only ones that we have in this neighborhood, but they are certainly the most proliferate. This is a beautiful example of an Italianate style house, the Veneman Mansion on Riverside Drive. One of the defining characteristics of the Italianate style are the heavy brackets that support the very prominent soffits at the top of the house. And this is a reference to an Italian villa. It has a low pitched roof that appears flat if you're standing on the ground in front of it. But I think the most fun characteristic of the Italianate style is that they usually have some sort of tower-like structure on the building somewhere, which is a reference to a campanile or a bell tower on an Italian church. This is a, just a great example. The colors of this house are very pleasant. The striped awning and the two-story iron porch make this one very special. This is an example of a French Second Empire style house. The main defining characteristic of the French Second Empire style is the mansard roof, and that's the steep shingled part at the top. And it's a French style of roof that was developed by the architect Francois Mansard in 18th century France. Another characteristic of the French Second Empire style are the coins or cornerstones seen on the corners of the building. On a European building, coins would have lent additional support to hold up the walls, but here they're only decorative and they're meant to give this house a very grand and European flavor. This one is especially nice with the French neoclassical sculptures that flank the front porch, the two-story iron balcony, and certainly the front door surround of carved limestone. This is a very exotic style. It's the Queen Anne style, and it has an asymmetrical facade. Queen Anne style houses usually have some sort of porch that covers the front entrance. Usually it's a round porch or a wraparound porch, and it has lots of spindle work, just like we see here. This house has a tower on one side that's topped by an exotic looking little pepper pot dome. The other side of it has a, something that's very typical for a Queen Anne style house, and that is a variety of textures on the outside. We have the horseshoe shape in the limestone, then we have brick, then we have the horseshoe shape again at the top, executed in little wooden fish scale shingles, and it's topped by a little gothic quatrefoil decoration at the top of the gable. I also like to talk about the social history of the properties, and that is about the people who lived in the houses, the families that built the houses, and I find that when you start talking more about people instead of architectural details, that you can come to feel a connection with a shared sense of our origins, a sense of shared history. If you can explain about the families who lived in the houses and when they lived and what their role was in the historic development of the city, people can relate to that. They can place themselves within a continuum of time and are, they have a sense of their own place in history. They can have a sense of their own place in the historical development of our city and in turn our region and in turn the development of our country. There are lots of arguments for historic preservation and they are things usually like neighborhood development, maybe something economic driven like property values within the historic district. But for me, what is most engaging about these houses is their aesthetic qualities. The sense of craftsmanship, the beauty of these houses when you're in their presence is sometimes overwhelming. And there are truly are lost arts that go into the making of these houses. The ability to work with materials like slate or to carve limestone or the exquisite carpentry are skills that are often lost today and are not generally seen in the construction 
of new houses. A historic landscape like this one, an authentic historic landscape, becomes more and more elusive as we move forward in time. It becomes more rare and it becomes more valuable and it really is the identity of our city. These historic buildings are what set the downtown area apart from suburbia. And as we seek to develop our downtown, to revitalize the center of our cities, as we seek to attract developers to the downtown area, we want to attract people to live and work, it's important that special care be taken to preserve the architectural details and this elusive landscape. As we move forward in time, if we allow them to be altered or demolished, we lose beautiful places that we need for our cities to be all that they can be, for our downtown to be all that it can be. If we allow it to be altered, we will have very little to offer but urban sprawl.